opinion, like what are the three fundamental questions that are still unanswered in cardiovascular medicine? Well, you know, I have a very uh, personal uh, perspective on what are the unanswered questions, and that's something which uh, I'm devoting my own investigative uh, life to. So uh, I think uh, we live in an era, we've heard just this morning at this uh, annual scientific session about uh, some of the preliminary uh, extension data of the uh, phase two and early phase three data with the anti-PCSK9 mm -hmm. agents. And they look very promising. And I think that in our time, we're going to have licked LDL. But, you know, unfortunately, our coronary care units are filled with people as you very well know, who have acute coronary syndromes, uh, but whose LDL may be 64, uh, but they have high triglycerides and low HDL. And I think that one of the frontiers we have to do is to deal with cardiovascular risk beyond LDL, because LDL is now solved in principle, and we'll know the place of anti-PCSK9 agents in practice, uh, really in in just a, a few years. and. Uh, Another issue is that, uh, and I'm not going to give you the answer now, but one of the preoccupations that mm -hmm. uh, troubles me as someone who's lived in the space of acute coronary syndromes since the dawn of coronary care, really, mm -hmm. uh, is that I think we're in a, a hinge point in the presentation and pathophysiology of acute coronary syndromes, and that the, uh, my trainees <laughs> uh, equate a, a type 1 MI with plaque rupture. And I think that that may be last century. So stay tuned to, to where that's going. So I think lipids beyond, uh, beyond LDL, LDL. Um, understanding sh changes in the demographics and pathophysiology and perhaps mechanisms and treatment of acute coronary syndromes um, are going to be uh, an issue that confronts us, particularly in a time when we have so many antiplatelet and antithrombotic agents that we're reaching diminishing returns, right? Uh, and then, of course, we heard, this is my own, uh, you, you'll notice that I was silent during the discussion of Dr. Ridker's <laughs> controversial sure. talk because I work very closely with him, and we're engaged in calling the question. This is another, another lesson, you mm -hmm. know, and Dr. Ridker said it very eloquently. Uh, it's one thing to play around with your test tubes and petri dishes and to uh, work with your animal experiments and to publish papers in learned journals. Ultimately, we have a mission in medicine, and we actually have a responsibility to call the question and test our cherished hypotheses in clinical trials. So again, one of the recurrent themes today is that you need the large-scale clinical trials. There is no other way to really answer the question about the risk-benefit of therapies. And so with Dr. Ridker, I'm engaged in some large-scale clinical trials that are putting our own PET hypothesis mm -hmm. uh, to the test. Yes. And you know, if the experiment uh, doesn't uh, really affirm our hypothesis, then you move on, okay? And so that's another important lesson yes. that is actually a corollary of where I started. So we've come full circle, and that is don't fall in love with your with oh, your hypothesis, hypothesis and be ready. This is the, the wonderful part of science that mm -hmm. keeps us all on our toes, is that this is not uh, religion, it's not fiat, mm -hmm. it is not received knowledge, but we're all experimentalists.